give um, people a minute to change your name, introduce yourself in the chat, and then we'll get started. I guess I have to say I'm okay with it being recorded. Do you want to? Yeah, okay. All right. All right, so I think uh, we'll get started. Um, so welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us on um, this special Sunday. Um, we are discussing Solidary Stronger Than Bars, Cross-Movement Prisoners Struggle. Um, and we have um, good information to share today. So um, I hope everyone learned something um, about someone that they didn't learn before and are able to support in whichever, whichever way possible. Uh, so my name is Rebecca Bonholm. I'm part of the the DC chapter of the national um, of the sorry <laughs> acronyms, the National Alliance Against Racist uh, Police Repression, and um, Paka is a member of that alliance. And my pronouns are she they. So I'll be um, facilitating the first part of the of this popular education session. And I just wanna uh, give y'all a rundown of what we'll do. So, um, like I said, my name's Rebecca. Um, we're gonna do the land acknowledgement, land back acknowledgement. We're gonna talk a little bit about the National Alliance Against Racist Police, uh, Racist Police Repression, also known as the Alliance. So I'll just refer to it as the Alliance. Um, then we will uh, then we'll talk about what we're gonna what will uh, the program will introduce a cultural performer. Then we'll have some presentations about the different political prisoners around the world, um, and then we'll have some guest speakers. Then we'll take some questions, um, and then there'll be a call to action. All right, so. Um, let's get started. So we always want to start off um, these sessions acknowledging that the land that we are on here in the United States does not um, belong to us. And so I'm going to read a land acknowledgement that was written by a Total Liberation Collective. Um, and you can actually follow, uh, I'm going to put the, the name of the collective. Um, they are on Instagram. Let's just put that in there real quick. Um, and you can follow them here. So let me just go ahead and read the landing not, not acknowledgement. Okay. Before DC became America's capital, the area was home to several indigenous groups <laughs> with complex political and economic relationships. We would like to acknowledge that we are standing on the land of Nankintuck people of the Pakitsaway Confederacy. The land was a major hub for trade and an area rich in natural resources. In fact, the Anacostia River is named after the Nagantuck as it was mispronounced by colonizers as the Nacostans. The history of Turtle Island's indigenous people has been actively erased by its colonizers. It is up to us to learn their history. Thank you and power to the people. So we'll take a couple of minutes to acknowledge that. A couple of seconds to acknowledge. All right. So then we're going to uh, just kind of talk about what the alliance is, right? Um, the National Alliance Against Racist and Political Pr Repression was founded in 1973 in Chicago, Illinois, to mount organized action against unjust treatment of individuals because of race or political beliefs. Its founding grew out of the struggle to free Angela Davis from the racist frame up on murder charges surrounding the aborted attempt by Jonathan Jackson to free his brother, George Jackson and the Soledad brothers in 1970. The Alliance's goals include freeing political prisoners, stop all police torture of suspects, 
secure health care for prisoners and community control over the police. All right. Um, so just a little a bit of information about what we'll talk about today. Um, so we will be presenting um, different community organizers of the various organizations that make up the alliance will be um, presenting um, on different political pr prisoners and supporting the call for their release um, in their re respective liberation struggles. Um, hundreds of freedom fighters in our struggles for liberation have faced racist and political repression. We got to remember those that did not survive as well as who those who were taken away from us in the many different ways. Um, our political prisoners must be remembered and we must support the cause for their release, the release of them all. All right, so now we're gonna, I'm going to introduce our, our cultural performer. I'm just going to read his bio real quick and then he, then he will take the floor. Um, Dark Mater is a 26 year old lyricist born and raised in Southeast Washington, DC. Dark Matter is a member of the Tribes Collective. Tribe stands for taking risks, investing in indigenous black experiences. And the musical group recently launched a fundraising initiative for grassroots organizations in the African diaspora. Dark Matter will be releasing his currently untitled debut al album later this year. The album will be a neo soul inspired ode to black women. Follow him on Twitter at what is dark matter and I'll share his. Uh... Yeah. All right, we're going to hear from dark matter. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm actually going to be reciting some poetry. That's all right. Um, I have two pieces that I wanted to perform. Political prisoners put away for playing how we all should. Revolution ain't televised. The cell reception and cells of prison cells be the bars that sign off doom. Gloom is not the reality, merely a portion, a figment. Imagining what's happening in totality around the globe. The elite keep the mind on a stranglehold and yo-yo. Inertia is a boomerang. John Adams still woo Africans trying to make a move and they'll drop bombs on you simply for trying to carve out your dreams when it contrasts with their cathartic schemes to make liberation seem like a lie or far off cry. The expression of congressional lies seems to be the truth that lets these sly foxes win. Placed on hold over phone, testifying for parole before pandemic. They never planned it to keep fighting as long as the fight's alive, then it's winding. Soon the out of Ecola shining light, whether pinning legacies like Mumia or building spirit just to see us see justice like this is how we move U.S. government and private business interests steady in cahoots, no games played. Shackles and chains are no more here, we say liberation proudly. The spirit of revolution is one that's never disarming. No matter the location or extent of sentence, the struggle run on and on like infinity rings, and we won't be at a loss. One last call, free them all. Um, free them all. Oh. One second, excuse me, just gather yeah, right. And this one is called We. Weary eyed, we stand withholding wild, idle visions of liberation. We, the people, know we. The forgotten, downtrodden, heavily pigmented bodies of Western empires written historical margins despite the pivotal roles we played. Oh, oh yes, we, the ones who maintained. Shackled head to foot, mouth to anus, and a stench of bile and anguish stacked and mandated as cargo for white western evils who forgot the evils of the origins of our anti-American experience. For honestly, if the American dream truly came with this apple pie and cream and it was true, we'd be heirs to over a billion. One percent is a talent. Oh yes, we. The shareholders of talent that brought West African rights to the coastal shorelines of the Carolinas. The indigo insight in our genes to make genes fashionably dance to the music you first loved to hate and now hate to love. We. Must be chosen people, how we make nothing into wine, pain, peeled, pairing, and painting portraits of poltergeist panting <sighs> at the bottoms of the Atlantic from overboard we wept from underseas we can't breathe in the spirits of those who left. Fallen martyrs, Tubman's, Turner's, Tucson's to Aragonas, we still fought all your wars from revolutionary to civil, even soldiers within the Confederacy to world wars to the Middle East, violent tours killing those with similar colonized imperial experiences because we have yet to learn. 
concerted loyalties to a patriarchal system which ejaculates at the sight of collective black misery even in our successes because although the trials and tribulations of million moons manifested we engage success of ecclesiastes proportions wisdom embedded enchanted environments of black success we like the weave inspire that inspired the cloth of the Ashanti's kente which we adopted rather than appropriated during time of diasporic unity that adopted for our successes for we Got women who lead education amongst the nation, for we know we need change like those before us. We contemplate the dangers of privatization, capital punishment, misappropriated black bodies, which is why we no longer fear we are we. Sirens more violent as we lynched independent, beaten outside of it due to an engineered linchpin system, fastened together to make killing niggas and making them that close to let his fashion. We transition ritualistic libations from bowls to 40 ounces of old English on curse sides of our fallen brothers, mothers, fathers, sisters, and cousins who ain't making home, and yet and still we. We are everything. We are ether. Carbon-based tranquility when we find peace. Go-go swinging in the midst of wavering evacuation in southeast. And yet still we are eloped to the universe for we are galactic beings. Walking earths who have forgotten that we are revolution. And revolution is we. Standing weary eye, gaining fragmented traction at wild idle visions of liberation. Welcome to the Vanguard. Wow. Thank you so much, Doc Miner, for um, sharing those two pieces. They were extremely powerful and definitely the right way to get um, our session today started. Um, Thank so you. like, beautiful, beautiful. So like I said, um, his Instagram handle is on the screen. Please follow him. I shared it in the chat. Um, so we're now we're gonna move on to the first presentation and Rashid will um, start us off. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Doc Matter, for that performance. Thank you, everybody, for being in attendance today. So we're going to talk about Mumia Abu-Jamal a little bit. First off, uh, happy birthday to Mumia. You know, please put that in the chat. Let's send him, you know, great energy, uh, you know, during this session and after for his birthday. So born on April 24th, 1954 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Mumia Abu-Jamal, an author, journalist, father, and husband was born. Uh, he grew up in a working class family and was politicized in 1968 after being be beaten up by the police. He actually says that he was kicked literally into the Black Panther Party by a police officer. You know, uh, so he decided to join the Black Panther Party I think he was one of the earliest members uh, of the Philadelphia chapter in 1969 at the age of 14. He was eventually appointed as Lieutenant of Information. Uh, so he was responsible for writing information and news communications. Uh, and, he, and he says that he was really trained in those things at the Black Panther Party. Uh, and he left the Black Panther Party and was employed at a, as a radio journalist uh, in the 1970s. Uh, and so like he, he, he does mention like that he was able to go on even after leaving the party, that he was able to use the skills that he took from the party to still help the movement. Uh, and during his time as a radio journalist, he began to cover the MOVE organization and eventually uh, became really affiliated uh, with, with MOVE. Through his journalism, he was known to, you know, vo give voice to the voiceless by uplifting their plight, uh, you know, lifting up the, the plight of the oppressed working people uh, all over the world. He was an internationalist, you know, based from his political education in the Panthers that was grounded in his uh, analysis and, of course, opposing racist capitalist political economic systems, uh, of course, led by the U.S. In 1982, Mumia was charged with the murder of a police officer and was sentenced to death despite the many inconsistencies and prosecu prose prosecutorial misconduct in his case. In 2011, his death was uh, his death sentence. So he was sentenced to death and his death sentence was uh, changed, overturned in 2011 uh, without the possibility of parole. So now Mumia has been incarcerated, you know, about 40 years, 30 of which have been in solitary confinement. So, you know, of course, we're still struggling um, and still fighting to bring back, bring home Mumia. Um, and because of his involvement with the Black Panther Party and supporting the MOVE organization and 
just generally raising the conscience of ordinary working people. Mumia was surveilled, uh, you know, by the FBI and the local Phila Philadelphia Police Department. Um, and, and of course, like they have records literally going back to when he was 14, 15 years old. So him becoming a grown man and, you know, getting set up by that same police department that uh, was surveilling him, you know, years before, it's, it's not a surprise. And the continued uh, repression and, and um, overall, they're, they're really setting him up and they're trying to, it's a conspiracy. Um, and there are many uh, good documentaries about that. And we're gonna talk about that in a second. Um, but yeah, he was, and he's been subjected to all kinds of torture inside, while inside prison, psychological, physical, and of course, medical neglect. And, um, you know, as much as all that, you know, occurred to Mumia, it, it has not broken his spirit, you know, and, and Mumia stays strong. And so we have to, at the very least, we can stay strong for Mumia, you know, as he's uh, dealing with all these things. And, um, yeah, so it's important that we also listen to Mumia and, you know, because Mumia is still putting in work, even though being behind bars for about four decades, still putting in work, still, you know, writing. And of course, you can still hear his commentary through prison radio. And uh, there's a really good film called Mumia Long Distance Revolutionary uh, that I would recommend folks check out. So, yeah, that's that's pretty much uh, what we wanted to cover from Mumia today on his birthday. And I do want to just kind of close out this particular part with a quote by Mumia. Prison is a second by second assault on the soul, a day to day degradation of the self, an oppressive steel and brick umbrella that transforms seconds into hours and hours into days. Can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. All right, so Asada Shakur, born July 16th, 1947 in Queens, from Queens, New York. Asada is an author, of course, a revolutionary, a mother. Uh, Asada was raised in a working class family. Uh, she, she ran away at an early age uh, because she noticed the unfairness of the world. And I think a lot of us can relate to that, you know, just wanting to get away from it all, um, you know, especially as a child you, and you're not given the political education to interpret the world around you uh, in, a, in a way that's healthy, then, you know, of course, you're going to have those, uh, you know, those type of feelings. It's, it's completely natural. She found her person and, and um, became politicized in the 1960s as a college student and began to study more political theory and participate, you know, political actions like sit-ins and protests while she was still in New York. Um, she did spend some time on the West Coast with the Black Panther Party uh, after she joined um, and she be became a, a party member and actually became, became like a leader. Uh, you know, this is because the Panthers were dealing with so much uh, state repression at the time um, that, you know, really leadership was left to people that were like some of the newer members. So she didn't just jump in the Panther Party and become a leader, but um, definitely her character and her work ethic set her apart from others. Um, and so, yeah, uh, Asada left the Black Panther Party eventually due to issue internal issues of course uh there was an internal split in the black panther party as well as you know people talk about uh the, the male chauvinism that was occurring uh in some chapters or among some people in the party however asada quickly uh you know out the the black liberation army came out of the black panther party and asada was a member of the black liberation army uh, at the time of her arrest. So like Mumia, she was being surveilled and, and persecuted by the state, the FBI, the New York and New Jersey police uh, and other agencies framed her, you know, and tried to frame her many times. Uh, and this, the cases usually didn't hold up in court. And, um, but eventually she was convicted 
on um, multiple charges for the New Jersey Turnpike shooting that occurred in 1973. She was imprisoned in 1974, uh, or uh, really, uh, as soon as she was captured, she was imprisoned. Uh, while being in prison, she was uh, she was held in male prisons. Uh, you know, she was beaten, denied medical care, and had to give birth while being chained to the hospital bed. Can you imagine? Um, so, you know, uh, Asada Shakur was liberated. You know, uh, and we have to. I think we have to speak to the importance of being part of. You know, a tightly organized collective, the Black Liberation Army, you know, they were highly politicized, they were very clear, and then they were organized and they were revolutionary in, uh, in the sense that, you know, they defined phenomena for themselves, the, they, you know, they had their principles and that's what they stuck to. So regardless of what the United States law says is, is right or wrong, you know, they had their own collective consciousness uh, that that motivated their actions to liberate Asada. Um, and so I think the, the importance of that is, especially after talking about Mumia, is that, um, you know, it's important to, it's important to fight and um, it's important to be part of organization. And it's, you know, like it, it can happen, it can turn out different ways. You know, Mumia is in prison at the moment, but we plan on getting Mumia free. Asada was freed. And then um, our next person that we're gonna talk about uh, also received their freedom in a different way. But even though Asada was liberated, so Asada uh, was liberated in 1978, 1979, and in 1984, the Cuban people and the Cuban government accepted Asada and she was granted political asylum in Cuba. Um, She's still on the, the FBI's most wanted terror list. Uh, and she was the first person to be added to that list. And, you know, Obama raised a bounty on Assad's head and I believe that was 2013. So that's just, you know, that just shows the, the, the facade that was the Obama uh, administration and just really the whole United States government that you can have a black president and that somehow means that there's progress uh <laughs> so uh so yeah uh let me see i wanted to read something uh by asada briefly um she's talking about mumia so just kind of wanted to keep mumia present uh in this part the first time i heard a tape of one of mumia's radio broadcasts it was the first time i fully understood why the united states government was so intent on putting him to death. I make a special appeal to you sisters and brothers to fight tooth and nail to save Mumia's life and to free him from the grips of his oppressors. As you honor our foremothers and forefathers, I urge you to honor your living, our living heroes. When you honor the names of Nat Turner, Harriet Tubman and Malcolm X, I urge you to honor the names of Geronimo Jijaga Pratt, Sundiata Coley, Matulu Shakur and Mumia Abu Jamal. I urge you not to forget and not to betray our living heroes. If we ignore their struggle, we are ignoring our own. If we betray our living history when we are betraying, then we are betraying ourselves. We could not save Malcolm X, but we can save Mumia. We can save him and we must save him because we love our brother and we need our brother to help us fight for freedom. Free Mumia Abu Jamal, free all political pr prisoners. Let us carry on tradition to freedom. All right, so um, yes, our next person is Daruba Ben Wahad. Daruba Ben Wahad uh, was born in 1944, also in New York. Uh, he's a writer, a fighter, and an elder in the movement. While serving time in jail for a petty crime, he became politicized uh, after the murder of Malcolm X. After being released from prison, he joined the Black Panther Party New York chapter and became a leader within that chapter. In 1971, he was charged with the attempted murder of two police officers. His first trial ended in a hung jury, his second in a mistrial, and the third, he was found guilty 
uh, which was not, that was 1973. He was sentenced 25 years to life after serving 19 of those years in prison. Darubu was able to get his conviction overturned by getting the FBI to release documents about the secret FBI operation called COINTELPRO, counter, the counterintelligence program which aimed to surveil, infiltrate, discredit, and disrupt uh, many political organizations, such as the Black Panther Party, the Black Liberation Army, MOVE, et cetera. Uh, and it's so funny, like, he, when, he, talks, when he, he wrote about it in a book uh, called uh, Still Black, Still Strong, this book is actually a compilation of essays from Daruba Ben Wahad, Mumia and Asad Shakur. So our presentation today is an ode uh, to that book, Still Black, Still Strong by those three freedom fighters. Um, but he talks about in that book uh, that they, you know, he, he, <laughs> he knew that they had more files with his name because of the, when they killed Fred Hampton and Fred Hampton's file filed a lawsuit against the Chicago Police Department. You know, there were, there were files. He was told that there were files with his name on it. But when he did his uh, Freedom of Information Act, they did not provide those particular files. So he knew that there were more out there. So he kept, so he, they kept uh, saying that there were no more. Eventually they were found and he was able to use those documents to gain his freedom. Um, and a quick uh, quote from Daruba Ben Wahad, the proper criterion for distinguishing right from wrong is not mysterious. It is embodied in the principles that advance the cause of the oppressed and exploited over the cause of those who live by oppression and exploitation. So I, uh, I'm gonna share some uh, links to uh, Mumia. We can, so with, for Mumia, July 3rd, there will be some actions happening around the country. And so we're encouraging folks uh, that are interested, especially if you're in the DC area, like uh, I know many folks are on this call, uh, we encourage you to link up with the DC Alliance so that we can, you know, have a strong action for DC because they're going to be actions all over the country on July 3rd for Mumia. Um, and this is going to be after his next court date, <clears throat> excuse me, which is June 29th. So please support Mumia. Uh, I'm going to post a link that folks can use to um, that folks can use to sign up for more information about that action um, July 3rd. So you can use that link, put in your information and you'll be getting uh, updates uh, moving forward. Now with the SADA, I think we definitely have to, you know, continue to salute and give thanks to the Cuban people and the Cuban government you know, for their solid, their continued solidarity, especially after, you know, heightened pressure by the United States government that really never stops. So we, we continue to give thanks to them. And then for Duruba bin Wahad, uh, our, our beloved elder has stage four cancer and we are uh, raising money for, for his treatment. So I'm gonna post the link, just posted the link in the chat to Daruba's GoFundMe. It will, there's about six or seven days left in that campaign uh, uh, to, to raise, for the GoFundMe to raise money. Um, but yeah, so that's pretty much it. I just encourage you all to support our, our current political prisoners, uh, our former political prisoners, because at the end of the day, they're political prisoners because they fought for us. And so we need to continue to fight for them. Um, Thank you all for joining. And uh, I wanna say that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, okay. she, oh, Rebecca would like to try yeah, Go ahead, go ahead, Pete. sorry. All right. The um, ones that should be just hanging around um, in their bedroom. Adam Kion uh, will be facilitating uh, the next uh, section uh, on the the black desk on the left side. Sorry. Um, Anna will be facilitating the next section on um, some political prisoners who have been seized recently in Negros Occidental. Um, they are some of many. 
um, political prisoners currently held under the Duterte regime in the Philippines. Um, but we wanted to take a minute to open with a song from Lucy Vantes, um, a Filipino um, artist in the DMV area um, who writes songs primarily in Tagalog. Um, this one has English captions, so feel free to read along. Um, for visual access, uh, he is standing in a room with his guitar and a microphone. Yeah, reached out to him, couldn't uh, perform live, but he's got vibes for days, and I think they came through there. 
um, and what he was talking about um, was how irrepressible um, the people uh, are and how irrepressible their struggle for freedom will be. Um, how, like the sea, you can't try it out, you can't take it away, and keep coming. Um, and that kind of ties a little bit into the particular case of political prisoners in the Philippines that I wanted to present on today, who are the Humamailan Three. I want to give some context, you know, because we're so far away. Um, on the context on where this case kind of arose, why the state chose to um, oppress these three uh, folks that I'll talk about in particular. So um, to start out with, I want to give some context on um, what the Filipino government would be call communist armed, armed conflict in the Philippines. Um, one of the longest running armed conflicts that the US itself kind of has a hand in is the communist rebellion in the Philippines. For decades, um, the Communist Party of the Philippines and the New People's Army have been um, mostly underground waging a um, armed struggle um, and reclaiming for the peasantry, primarily in rural areas, um, Filipino land. Um, this especially got heightened under the Marcos dictatorship. That's where um, a lot of energy kind of entered this movement. Uh, the Philippines in general, it's um, a very long history, obviously, which we can't cover entirely, but um, the Philippines has um, faces a lot of foreign ownership of land, um, faces a lot of um, internal ownership of land by oligarchs who collaborate with foreign powers. Um, Kind of the structure of colonialism in the Philippines has certainly evolved from the days under Spanish colonization and American colonization. Um, but one consistent bit has been that peasantry has been dispossessed of the land that they themselves work uh, consistently throughout. And this is one of the main aims of organizations like the Communist Party of the Philippines, uh, founded by this um, old guy on the left, uh, Jose Maria Sison, um, uh, and the NPA, or New People's Army. Um, they are not the only left in the Philippines. The left in the Philippines is very diverse, um, and the people are engaged in a lot of different ways, but certainly this particular conflict between the Filipino army and national police and the NPA kind of forms the context of a lot of the oppression of the left in general in the Philippines. In the middle is a paramilitary group, um, so not officially sanctioned by the Filipino um, government itself, but acting often with Filipino government funding to carry out um, extrajudicial um, violence uh, for the Filipino state and um, its beneficiaries. Um, so that's one of the context. Uh, Himamailan is a city in Negros Occidental, um, which is one area where um, there's recently been a lot of political um, conflict. On March 18th of this year, um, and this text is on the screen, uh, NDFP peace consultant Ramon Patriarca and two youth activists, CJ Matarlo and John Michael Tixon, uh, were arrested in Kimamailan city under false charges of weapons possession. 
Um, Ramon Patriarca was formerly incarcerated for several years, um, I believe from around 2010 to 2014, um, as a political prisoner back then too, also on trumped up charges, eventually got out and has really been doing um, organizing and research work since. Uh, the two youth activists uh, were students in the area who are working with him on a particular study. Um, this picture in the middle, I believe is CJ Matardo, but um, I am not exactly sure. Um, part of what happens in the context of the armed struggle I was describing previously is that the Filipino government can use that struggle as a pretense to kind of preemptively criminalize anyone who presents a sort of threat to them by saying these people are, you know, these bad communists with guns. These are the communists that we're talking about that we're actively in a war with. Um, this means that the government and paramilitary forces um, associated with the government often have the freedom to um, basically accuse anybody that challenges them of being NPA or being Communist Party of the Philippines, um, these explicitly outlawed organizations, and then either actively pursuing violence and um, imprisonment against them or encouraging paramilitary or pro-state um, forces uh, to exact some sort of extrajudicial violence upon them. Um, a lot of the kind of propaganda and military coordination of this whole um, red tagging mechanism is happening under the National Task Force to End Local Communist Armed Conflict, or NTF-LCAC, um, which the current president, Rodrigo Duterte, has consistently um, kept very well funded. Um, uh, it's been one of the arms of Duterte's broader expansion of state violence in the Philippines. Um, if y'all don't know about President Rodrigo Duterte, he's been in power um, since 2015 um, and um, has been one of the most explicitly violent Filipino presidents we've seen since Ferdinand Marcos, uh, who's probably the only Filipino president who's achieved any sort of notoriety of, uh, um, overseas, yes, uh, Nelly, uh, 2016, sorry, Duterte was elected. Um, and one of the ways he's done this is through a drug war. Duterte's drug war is a really strange thing to see as someone who grew up in the United States. Um, who grew up in communities which were divided and um, attacked along lines um, drawn through the US drug war. Duterte's drug war, as someone familiar with the US drug war at the time Duterte came into power and started doing it his way, um, it feels like it very sloppily steals from the US's own playbook of mass incarceration and political violence, given how the US has used drug criminalization and the various ways they control it to really attack not only poor people and racially oppressed groups, um, but any sort of political opposition or organizers. Um, who attempt to build any sort of strength um, against that sort of violence. Um, these connections run really deep. Um, I don't think 
it's coincidental that, you know, the Philippines learned so much from state violence in the U.S., given the role of U.S. state violence in Filipino history. But um, this, again, is some important context for the case of the uh, Kima Mylon III and um, similar cases um, throughout the Philippines. Uh, Duterte has really mobilized the military and the police with this whole like drug war call. We're going to crack down on drug users, drug dealers, that sort of thing. And suddenly there's tons of money in the army and the police that they will use against anyone who opposes them. That includes labor organizers, that includes um, members of opposing political parties, that includes uh, poor people, who, 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 whoever the um, army sees on the street smoking a cigarette that they want to get rid of. Um, um, that sort of, it, it normalizes violence against the people by the state to have that sort of pretense there um, in a way that I, I don't think I need to explain to a lot of you because you've seen similar things yourselves um, in many ways. And um, it makes the sort of brutal scapegoating violence that um, Ramon Patriarca, CJ Matarlo and John Michael Texon um, have recently experienced so normal, so normal that, you know, 30,000 people have been killed extrajudicially under the Duterte regime and um, Filipinos are still crying for anyone in the world to hear about it. Um, um, okay, so what were the Hima Mylan three doing and why were they arrested under charges of weapons possession? Um, the charges of weapons possession, um, very much normal for the army and the police to lie about this sort of thing in the Philippines. Um, they uh, straight up killed five um, people doing community organizing and education and dressed them up in NPA uniforms uh, recently to justify it. Um, that was the new Bataan five. Um, so the charges of weapons possession, they really have complete freedom to make that sort of thing up. However, the organizers around them knew what they were actually doing. <clears throat> These three people were conducting a study. Um, they were studying conditions of peasants on the Cojuanco estates. Um, more context. The Coanco uh, family is one of the oldest kind of oligarchical families in the Philippines. Um, they have been very, very wealthy landlords, politicians, and um, industry leaders uh, since the 1860s in the Philippines. And um, some of their most famous members um, have been presidents. Um, Cory and Nonoy Aquino. Um, Cory Aquino was the first president after Marcos and was heralded as you know some sort of liberator. And Nonoy Aquino was her son, um, who was um, later elected president. Um, they're members of this family. Um, other connections this family has. One of the largest banks in the Philippines, Bancom, is uh, run by them. Um, a member of the Cuanco family um, uh, was in charge of the San Miguel Corporation, which you might know from the beer, um, is, is, is probably how you might know about San Miguel. Um, they're, the, they're one of the largest uh, food and beverage producers in Southeast Asia, though. Um, anyway, they own loads of land, and this land is not worked by them, it's worked by peasants. And um, land reform in the Philippines, getting peasants more control over the land they live and work on, um, has long been kind of this like rallying cry of what politicians promise to do for the people. Um, it's one of the many things they promise. Um, there were some land reforms 
in the area that would have affected the Kohanko estates. What the Himamailan three were investigating was the effects of the legal exemption of the Kuhanko family's land from these reforms. The Kuhanko family basically made it so that any sort of change in the law that would have shifted power to the peasants did not apply to their estates. And these leftist researchers were like, okay, so what effects is this having on the conditions of the peasants living here? That even the meager policy changes that they make to supposedly put a little bit more well-being in the hands of peasants uh, don't even apply when the family at question is one of the most powerful families in the Philippines. This research is dangerous, not only for Duterte and for the army he commands, but for you know the America-friendly liberal oligarchs like the Aquinos um, that continue to benefit from a system that whether headed by Duterte or headed by somebody who's nominally opposed to um, someone as like vulgar and violent as he is, um, they, they benefit from the continued uh, oppression and exploitation of the peasantry. Um, whether Duterte is in power or someone else from the oligarchy is in power, this sort of research is a threat. So this is some of why they were arrested. Um, they have not yet been released. Um, their co-organizers are still trying to find out information from them. It's been since March. Um, and yeah, um, I think this one case, and pardon me if I've talked so much that this is kind of like redundant, but this one case really touches a lot of the threads of how American imperialism, how oligarchy and kind of this bureaucrat capitalism that we see in the Philippines, um, how control over land and violence on people to control land kind of all come together in the Filipino struggle. Um, and I don't know, as people in America, if we are to learn from this, um, one thing we might learn is that the narratives we build here around state violence, around drugs, around the role of incarceration, around how we respond to power, how we enforce power, um, these things are improvised upon around the world. Um, people will take the stories we built about violence um, and use them in their own contexts with their own ingenuity. And sometimes that means people like Duterte, organizations like NTF, ALCAC, um, taking things that may seem familiar to us and using them in horrifying new ways. Um, all right, I'll pass it back. All right, so this is me, if you want to click it again. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for this uh, very important information. Uh, we should all uh, be learning more about this, especially as these situations develop. Um, I know in the Philippines, there's always a lot of new information coming out uh, um, almost daily, it seems. Uh, my name is Christian Guevara. I am here on behalf of the Claudia Jones School for Political Education. I'm a member of the DCYCL, and I'm also representing WUFDI, uh, the World Federation of Democratic Youth, which is an international anti-imperialist organization founded after World War II. Moving towards a different part of the world uh, is a conflict that we've heard about pretty much nonstop from the US perspective here, uh, at least a very specific perspective that we hear a lot about. Uh, I don't wanna repeat too much of the things that we already know, but to recap, Ukraine is at war with Russia. 
um, and before that has had some pretty significant uh, political instability. Protests against the Ukrainian president at the time in 2014 led to a coup that ous ousted that president. Um, and since then, there's been a war um, in their um, eastern Donbass region uh, that's killed uh, about 15,000 people uh, before this year, uh, before everything in this year started. Uh, in 2014, the Communist Party opposed the government, um, and they also opposed the protests. Um, they were not for the current president, but they were also not for um, replacing him with a different government. Um, so in 2014, the new government uh, of Ukraine decided to introduce laws in support of decommunization. Um, the Ukraine was part of the USSR um, in, until 1990. Um, this, uh, so this uh, new law uh, was a uh, removal of communist symbols. Uh, anything uh, relating to communism in, in Ukraine is now banned. Uh, the banning of uh, communist parties, including the Communist Party of Ukraine, the largest uh, Communist Party, which, which received 2.6 million votes in 2012, the last election they were allowed to participate in. Um, 2.6 million is a lot of votes um, in a, like a, for a communist, openly communist party. Uh, Ukraine uh, government has been actively attempting to stop left-wing organizations from opposing their moves to discreetly sell off their land and privatize their country. Uh, this has a lot to do with uh, the collectivization of uh, land uh, during the time of the USSR um, and then their move towards kind of neoliberal government. It's kind of just the same development of that. Um, in Ukraine today, communist symbols are banned um, in association with communists is a dangerous uh, existence. Communist opposition to the expansion of NATO and the coddling of Europe has led the Ukrainian government to target real left wing parties. Uh, by real left wing, I mean like the actual communist party. Um, because these progressive liberals are not a threat to the increased neoliberalization of Ukraine. Um, according to our comrades in Ukraine, the banning of the Communist Party was intended to clear the political field of left parties so they would not interfere with the lowering social standards and selling land. Um, if we're, we can move on to the next slide. So what does this have to do with uh, political prisoners? On March 6th of this year, two members of Ukraine's Leninist Communist Youth Union, uh, Mikhail and Alexander Kananovich, were arrested by Ukrainian security forces for allegedly undermining the current situation in Ukraine. Um, the, uh, the Communist Youth Union is uh, essentially their equivalent of our YCL, or Young Communist League um, in Ukraine that has now been banned. Uh, in 2016, uh, Mikhail and other members of their Youth Communist Union uh, members were uh, assaulted by a group of right-wing militants uh, while laying flowers at the monument of, a, of Red Army soldiers uh, who fought against Hitler uh, in Ukraine. Uh, Mikhail was seriously injured and another member uh, almost lost their sight. Uh, there is an interview online that I've found I can, that I have in my notes here for it uh, where he uh, he did in 2016, where I actually described some of it. Unfortunately, it's not translated, so I didn't want to add it in and have to deal with that. But uh, in 2019, um, he did an interview where he also describes uh, uh, the Communist Youth Union's mobilizations against the privatization of public farmlands by the current president, uh, President Volodymyr Zelensky. Uh, most recently, the Kanonovich brothers are known for attending a demonstration in front of the U.S. Embassy in Ukraine, demanding a, the U.S. stop its military expansionism through NATO. Uh, and since this arrest, these brothers have been beaten several times um, and are being held at a pre-child detention center um, in Kiev. So this, uh, their movement towards uh, wanting uh, their official position of their party and their group is that they want, uh, they want the war to just stop. <laughs> they want to try to seek some kind of peaceful means to, to an end. Um, so because of that, they're being uh, called Russian spies. Uh, they actually, and they additionally haven't been even allowed to leave the country since 2014 uh, because of their association with the Communist Party. Um, so it is the YCL stance that uh, no peace in Ukraine will be possible while the multinational character of its population is not recognized and celebrated. Um, and while the aspirations of the Ukrainian people for democracy um, and equality uh, are suppressed under the suffocating atmosphere of wartime nationalism. Thus, we demand uh, from the Ukrainian government the immediate release of the Kononovich brothers because they're still, um, as of the last update that we got in late March, are still uh, uh, imprisoned. 
um, and uh, an end to the political repression against the Communist Party and its youth wing, um, as well as uh, apologies to their families, uh, printed or press. Um, I wanted to just uh, kind of look back at the Philippines and some of what was already mentioned, um, as well as just some you know, general kind of parallels that I think I saw. Uh, we see a lot of similar struggles um, while our comrades on the ground see Duterte as a very dangerously far right. Uh, you know, here we know that he's, you know, a dangerous far right character. His liberal opposition, um, while opposing him like on the surface, you know, in the next election, um, they don't fundamentally disagree with uh, the, the policies that he, that he holds, this like neoliberal uh, policy that uh, doesn't really have a, a care or interest in indigenous populations. Um, and ultimately doesn't provide any solution to the, to the serious problems that everyday citizens face. Uh, so this in, with this in mind, I believe we're noticing kind of a pattern here where it's a repressive policy that is followed by neoliberalization. Uh, so we, you know, in, in the Philippines, it's a lot, it's a, it's a bit more clear to see, um, you know, where people might compliment uh, something like a, like putting up a building or a road or something, but uh, that comes at the expense of the indigenous communities that live in those areas. Um, and, you know, these uh, cleaning up the streets, you know, comes at the expense of, uh, you know, criminalizing being a young person in the country, right? Um, so in reinvigorated nationalism is followed by the suppression of communist movements, um, the bolstering of right-wing ideologues in Ukraine, that's people like Stepan Bandera that are now being uh, very, uh, pridefully uh, shown around the country. Um, in the liberal sphere um, in Ukraine, the election of a young Jewish man like Volodymyr Zelensky, who supports legalizing prostitution, the acceptance of gay people, these are all these are, you know, great things. It seems like real progress, uh, but to the people who are really paying attention to the material economic conditions of Ukraine, that is the communists, they know that it's more of the same destructive neoliberal policy. They, and that same policy ultimately ends up hurting those people and ends up hurting sex workers, the LGBTQ plus people, and ends up hurting targeted minorities like Jews and Roma, um, specifically in Ukraine. Um, so I think the, the Kananovich brothers are an example of what happens when you legitimately oppose capitalism in the way that uh, Mumia and the way that uh, Asada Shakur oppose capitalism and um, need to be put behind bars or need to be, uh, maybe in the case of uh, Claudia Jones, barred from being in the country at all. Uh, you know, when, when you, let's be clear that when communists are banned from political office, when they're banned from political spaces, when they're banned from just existing, um, it's not because they're pro-Russia, uh, it's because their existence is a threat to the government, uh, to the Ukrainian government, from their perspective, as long as they have reminders of communism, as long as they have statues of Lenin and um, hammers and sickles and stuff like that, people will always have the idea that, you know, maybe something else is possible. Maybe there's another option. Uh, but as we all know, uh, communism, you know, uh, socialism, the idea that workers should be in power, that doesn't lie in, that's not in statues or in flags. That's in the consciousness of the workers and of the working class. And as long as the capitalists exist, there will be communists fighting against them. Uh, so thank you all uh, for letting me uh, tell you all about this. And I uh, appreciate the opportunity. And that, that's what I have for today. Um, okay, so hi everyone, my name is Raya. I'm with the Palestinian Youth Movement, um, DMV chapter. I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, political prisoners in the Palestinian context. Um, so the prisoner struggle in Palestine has always been crucial to our national liberation movement. Imprisonment is a longstanding tool to control resistance to violent powers. And in Palestine, um, imprisonment has been used as a political strategy for collective punishment, and in particular has been used to suppress um, uh, leadership, uh, punish those who resist uh, Zionist violence and break apart families and the Palestinian social fabric. Um, Zionist policy of imprisoning Palestinians in mass intensified um, specifically after 1967 and more than 800,000 Palestinians have been imprisoned by the Zionist entity since. Um, so Palestinian Prisoners Day is every year on, oh, sorry, I think it's the same slide. So, yeah, thank you, <laughs> same slide. Um, it's every year on April 17th. And this year there are about um, 
4,500 Palestinians behind bars. Up to 1,000 of them are children and 530 of them were arrested under administrative detention, which is an act that allows Zionist forces to preemptively and indefinitely detain any Palestinian who they suspect is likely to pose a threat in the future. Um, so under administrative detention, Palestinians are not only arrested without charge, but are also deprived of a trial. And this practice actually um, dates back um, to the period of British imperialism, um, the British mandate over Palestine, which was between 1920 and 1948, um, and was specifically a tactic used against Palestinian resistance. Um, next slide, please. Um, okay, so this last point is important because it, it matters that these methods specifically responded and emerged in relationship to Palestinian resistance to squash it um, and have been expanded upon by Israelis in the present day. Expansions of the prison system include the creation of more prisons, especially torture prisons, um, and the continuous implementation of high security surveillance technology um, that's, that continues to evolve. So from American companies usually like Albit systems, for example. In the 1970s, the Palestinian prisoners movement started to grow following Israel's rapid occupation of further Palestinian lands. And it became um, a powerful community actor that engaged in programs of education, history, political theory, um, language and language learning. Um, and in the decades to come, the Zionist prison would become an important site of political organization as part of the broader Palestinian national movement. So the pictures shown here are three photos from big uprisings in Palestine, which, um, in which expansive sectors of Palestinian society stood their ground against Israel's violent occupation and siege. Um, the first is the first Intifada, um, then the second Intifada, and then recently you might remember the Great March um, of Return in, in Gaza. Um, and we lost thousands of uh, or people from these uprisings, Allah your home home, and we still resist. Um, so the image on the left, um, it's an image of an embroidered piece by Palestinian prisoner Ahmed Kawasmi called a message from behind prison bars to my patient mother on the occasion of Mother's Day. Um, I just thought it was a nice piece of art. Um, and the image on the right, um, shows now free Maher al-Akhras, a 49-year-old Palestinian prisoner laying in a hospital bed of an Israeli hospital in critical condition from being 70 days into his hunger strike. Um, and so in the midst of the COVID pandemic, Maher began his hunger strike in protest of his indefinite detainment under administrative detention. Um, and as Palestinians and Arabs rose up internationally um, and his health deteriorated quickly, he was released 103 days into his hunger strike and was reunited with his wife and daughter. So this goes to say that Palestinian resistance remains strong in Zionist prisons. Um, prisoners have, Palestinian prisoners have organized mass hunger strikes to protest the injustices of the colonial Zionist authority in the past. The demands of their hunger strikes include things like visitation rights, proper medical care, end to solitary confinement, end to administrative detention, access to education and immediate release. Hunger strikes have been one of the most effective um, but risky tools for, prisoners, for prisoners to free themselves. Um, and like I mentioned before, Zionist prisons were also spaces where prisoners could exchange knowledge. So educational programs um, have been organized in Zionist prisons, um, teaching history, foreign languages, political theory, and more. And this also included the production of magazines by the prisoners and the dissemination of notebooks featuring poetry and other literary texts. Um, and the last thing I wanna talk about is um, a different form of res uh, resistance in, by prisoners. Um, so they resisted by simply communicating with each other um, inside and outside of the prison. They transferred messages um, outside of the prison using small capsules that they would sometimes swallow um, and they transferred messages inside the prisons using um, cigarette papers. And another method of communication that prisoners use is called um, Torita, which um, this YouTuber, Sopitaha, 
Um, I think he explained it really well in this specific clip. So I'll just let him explain it in, in this video. Um, if the, can you press on the link? Yeah, thank you. Six Palestinians. In light of the six Palestinians successfully escaping from Israeli prison, I'd like to share a Palestinian tradition that was created to help Palestinians escape from jail. It is a style of traditional Palestinian folk song called Tarwide, which is a coded language, a coded style of song used to send encrypted messages to those who are in prison. And this dates back even before the establishment of Israel in 1948, back during the British colonization, when an overwhelming amount of Palestinians were being wrongfully imprisoned just for speaking up against the British rule. So this left a huge population of Palestinian women whose brother or father or husband or son was being held in prison for no reason. Now this was obviously before air conditioning existed, so pretty much all the prison cells had windows to the outside with those metal bars going across them. So these Palestinian women would walk along the exterior walls of these prisons and sing these songs to communicate with their loved ones in prison. So from the view of the British or Israeli occupier, it just looks like there's a random Palestinian woman walking around singing folk songs when she's actually sending a message to her husband or her brother about how she's going to help him escape from the prison. And to encrypt the message, they would add the letter L or Lam in Arabi in between words and letters repeatedly to make it sound like gibberish or sound like some other Palestinian dialect that the occupiers don't understand. Because obviously the occupiers have Arabic translators, but not ones good enough to understand a coded language. So in one version of this song style, there is a Palestinian woman who is communicating with her father who was in jail and she's telling him how much she misses him and then she gives him instructions on how to escape. In the first line, she explains where the prison is in relation to their village so that whenever he escapes, he knows which direction to run. But instead of just saying the village is north or Dirishmali, she sings it and uses poetry and adds the letter L. So in order to say she'll say then she explains which direction the front door of the prison is facing so that whenever he escapes through the front door he knows which direction to run because as she already told him the village is north so if the door is facing the north all he has to do is get out the front door and run straight and he'll eventually hit their village so to communicate this, she recites And then to communicate how much she misses him, she recites There's another version of this song style that shows how they would use poetry and analogies and symbolism to encrypt the messages on top of the L trick. Here, the woman is trying to comfort her loved one who's stuck in prison. And to express this, she says, the gazelle that's stuck inside won't be in there for too long. And she recites this by saying, <laughs> Then she expresses that she doesn't want new clothes, she doesn't want a new belt, she just wants to see her loved one free. And so she recites Ugh, It breaks my heart, but at the same time, it's just so beautiful and rich and ugh. Since the British oh, colonized the land crazy. over a hundred years ago up to today. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I just, I thought that was a really cool, um, way that uh, prisoners used to resist, prisoners and their <clears throat> loved ones used to resist. <clears throat> um, so moving on, I'm gonna talk about a few different cases of Palestinian prisoners, which you may or may not have heard about. Um, so the first one is uh, Khaleda Jarrar. She was given a two year sentence on account of her political activism, during which she was subjected to various forms of abuse and persecution. Um, and with less than two months before her release, her daughter, Soha Jarrar, um, passed away suddenly. And 
um, a campaign for her, for her mom, Khalida's release gained even more traction um, after this so that people, so that um, she could potentially um, go bury her daughter, go to her daughter's funeral. Um, the occupation court denied her demands and she wasn't able to attend her daughter's funeral, um, even with less than two months left um, with, on her term. Um, but after two years of unjust imprisonment, she was free. And after she was released, she went straight from the prison um, to her daughter's grave to visit her daughter. Um, so yeah, I'll move on. Um, next, I wanna talk about um, Palestinian prisoners in a different context. So um, the Holy Land Five, um, they were imprisoned in the US. Um, the graphic on the right is from three years ago. It's now been um, almost 14 years since five Palestinian Americans who were pillars of their communities were imprisoned. They led the largest Muslim charity in the US called the Holy Land Foundation for Relief and Development. Um, after 9-11, George Bush waged the domestic war on terror in 2001, and he designated the Holy Land Foundation, or the HLF, as a terrorist organization. Um, stating that the government would seize their assets and close them down. So the five members were convicted on false charges of providing material support for terrorism, um, even though the U.S. government itself acknowledged that the financial support the HLF sent to Palestine went to charities that supported widows and orphans under occupation, um, and were also the same charities that the U.S. government itself sent money to. Um, so it's very hypocritical. Um, it's also... Um, worth noting that not a single dollar was used for any violent activities. Um, it was literally just a charity organization, and yet the and yet five key members of the HLF, um, who are listed on the screen, um, were unjustly convicted in 2008. They were given sentences of between 15 um, and 65 years in prison, and were put in the communications units, um, often dubbed Gitmo North, in reference to. Um, Guantanamo Bay, um, due to the severity and the discriminatory nature of their conditions. Um, and there's a lot more to this case that I won't get into for the sake of time, um, but involves um, fabricated evidence and the first time in legal history that a court allowed an expert witness to testify under anonymity, this witness being an Israeli intelligence agent. Um, but you can also learn more on PYM's website. Today, we continue to honor the HLF 5 um, and fight for justice for all political prisoners. Um, so the next uh, case I wanna talk about is um, happened this past year, um, sometimes called the great escape of um, people who are seen as heroes from Janine in Palestine. So this is a photo that's circulated widely on social media. Um, it's of a tunnel that uh, six Palestinian prisoners used um, to escape from the Joboa Zionist detention center um, using just kitchenware and utensils. So the Zionist army, of course, started hunting them right away, and eventually they were all captured, but their escape will always be a victory to our people. Um, our prisoners continue to guide us forward and lead by example with their steadfastness. Um, and the, the, their escape really energized Palestinians and Arabs in Palestine and in exile, so all over the world. And in a letter to his mother, Hamid al-Arda, one of the um, escapees said that he was able to eat cactus fruit for the first time in 22 years, and that he was able to roam the mountains near his hometown and feel at home. Um, he also wrote that he had a jar of honey in his pocket to bring her if he ever saw her again. Um, and so we were able to hear a little bit from the prisoners, which was, um, which was really nice. Um, one of my favorite things is something Yaqub Qadri said, which is, um, he said, I will try to escape again and there's nothing like the taste of freedom. And I love this a lot because even after being caught and suffering the consequences of that, he couldn't deny even publicly that he'll continue to try to escape. Um, so on the next slide, there are photos depicting just how much of an impact <clears throat> the escape of the six had on our people. Spoons became an exciting symbol of resistance for us at the time. 
Um, the picture on the right was taken in DC at the Embassy of Israel, where the Palestinian youth movement threw a bunch of spoons in front of the um, embassy after the six prisoners escaped. The picture on the top left is of some Palestinian men holding up spoons. Um, and the picture on the bottom left is of an artist painting a mural commemorating the six escapees. So um, on the next slide, bringing it back to right now, um, we're demanding, we, the Palestinian youth movement are demanding the freedom and immediate release of Ahmed um, Anasra to his family. Um, he's, um, so in 2015, after occupation forces raided his neighborhood, Ahmed, who was 13 years old at the time, was run over by the occupation forces and left to bleed. Um, images of his body were spread all over social media and later occupation forces detained him after he witnessed the shooting and murder of his older cousin by the Israeli occupation forces. Um, so leaked footage of Ahmed's interrogation um, was released and it showed horrific abuse at the hands of the IOF, the Israeli occupation forces. Um, so at just 13 years old in 2015, he was tried as, a, as an adult, um, illegally detained, denied access to his family, tortured, wrongfully convicted, and sentenced to 12 years in, in Zionist prisons. And now 20 years old, Ahmed has endured years of psychological and physical torture at the hands of the occupation with his mental health in continuous decline. Um, and so on Wednesday, April 13th, um, uh, 10, 11 days ago, Ahmed had a hearing at the occupation courts in an attempt to shorten his sentence. And Palestinians all over the world are demanding his immediate release so that he can be reunited with his family and treated by Palestinian doctors. Um, and I'll play this video that features his dad um, talking about um, the impact of, his, of this campaign on Ahmed and their family. But if they could you, um, make it full screen because the translation is kind of small. وضعه في الزنزانه لحاله وطبعه كان شاعر انه فيش حدا معاه وشاعر انه مش راح يروح شاعر انه راح يضل طول عمره بالسجن اخر زياره امه يعني كانت تقول له انه الناس سو sorry I can't full screen within the presentation but I might be able to um, get it up on YouTube mm -hmm. Sorry, YouTube is just telling me about full screen videos. Um, thank you, YouTube. That does not help. Oh, it's okay. Uh, sorry, I didn't realize I was muted. I think it's I think it's all right actually, as long as people can read it. Um, I think it's fine. وضعه في الزنزانة لحاله وطبعه كان شاعر إنه فيش حدا معاه وشاعر إنه مش راح يروح. شعر انه راح يضل طول عمره بالسجن اخر زياره امه يعني كانت تقول له انه الناس يسوي لك حملات وانه الناس بطالبه باخراجك وانه سوينا حمله دوليه طبعا هذا شعرت انه اعطى امل لاحمد فلما قلنا له انه الناس كلها واقفه جنبك حس بالطمانينه حس بالامل وحس بالدفء فالهاشتاجات والشغلات هذه الالكترونيه ترفع من امل من معنويات احمد ومن معنويات اهل احمد اسال الله انها تكون yeah, so that was just his dad talking about how um, after his mom told him um, during a visit that people were campaigning for his release, it gave him a little bit of hope and his family a little bit of hope. Um, so we're going to keep pushing for his release. And on the next slide, I'm going to talk a little bit about some ways that we can... Um, some things we can do to support his release. Um, so one thing we can do is sign this petition. <laughs> I'll put it in the chat. Um, it's the Palestine Global Mental Health Network's petition demanding his immediate release. Um, another thing you can do is follow the Palestinian youth movement on social media, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and share our posts about him um, with the hashtag free Ahmed Manasra. Um, and you can also learn more about his case at this website um, on the screen. And yeah, I'll put these in the chat. Please do sign the petition and follow PYM on social media. Um, but I wanted to close out the presentation um, by
by passing it to Muhammad, who's also with PYM, who's um, going to read a poem and talk a little bit about it. Cool, thanks, Raya. <clears throat> so um, first, I'll just re quickly read it, and then I'll explain some of the significance of it. I think it's a really good place to end this present um, our presentation on. Um, it's called Enemy of the Sun by Palestinian poet Samih al Qasim. I may, if you wish, lose my livelihood. I may sell my shirt and bed. I may work as a stonecutter, a street sweeper, a porter. I may clean your stores or rummage your garbage for food. I may lay down hungry, O oh, enemy of the sun, but I shall not compromise and to put into the last pulse in my veins, I shall resist. You may take the last strip of my land, feed my youth to prison cells. You may plunder my heritage, you may burn my books, my poems, or feed my flesh to the dogs. You may spread a web of terror on the roofs of my village, O enemy of the sun, but I shall not compromise, and to the last pulse in my veins I shall resist. You may put out the light in my eyes, you may deprive me of my mother's kisses. You may curse my father, my people, you may distort my history. You may deprive my children of a smile and of life's necessities. You may fool my friends with a borrowed face. You may build walls of hatred around me. You may glue my eyes to humiliations, O enemy of the sun, but I shall not compromise and to the last pulse in my veins I shall resist. O enemy of the sun, the decorations are raised at the port. The ejaculations fill the air, a glow in the hearts. And in the horizon, a sail is seen challenging the wind and the depths. And it is Ulysses returning home from the sea of loss. It is the return of the sun of my exiled ones. And for the sake and for her sake and his, I swear I shall not compromise. And to the last pulse in my veins, I shall resist, resist, and resist. So some people may um, already be familiar with, with the significance of this poem, but if not, um, yeah, this is a poem by Samih al-Qasim, who was a Palestinian poet and organizer who lived in Palestine. Samih was imprisoned multiple times for his political activities throughout his life and for his resistance against the Zionist regime of Israel. He once said, I have chosen to remain in my own country, not because I love myself less, but because I love my country more. He wrote Enemy, he wrote Enemy of the Sun, which is this poem, in prison, in which his spirit of resistance and love for his people was echoed. Meanwhile, many years later in California and San Quentin prison in 1971, George Jackson and other prisoners were resisting. When the prison guards broke into George's cell to look for information about the prisoner uprisings, they found a bibliography and a digest that detailed over 99 books that um, George had in his cell. Inside, inside that included handwritten copies of two poems from the collection, Enemy of the Sun, which is this poem that I just read, and I Defy by Samih al -Qasim. In the weeks following George Jackson's assassination in 1971 by the prison guards, his digest was collected and published inside the Black Panther newspaper under his name. Now, this is a poem that resonated so deeply across time and thousands of miles of space that the Panthers understandably thought it was actually penned by George because of the same spirit and the same voice. As Berkeley professor Greg Thomas once put it, this error was in fact a mis uh, quote mistake of radical kinship. I like the way he, fr he frames it that way. He believed that George had copied these poems to distribute them amongst the prisoners. Ultimately, Samih's poem resonated with George and other resisting prisoners. Greg Thomas would go on to interview Palestinian prisoners and tell them the story and say, yes, this poem is yours, it is all of ours, meaning that this poem represents our shared and collective struggle for national liberation and speaks to the universality of the structures which suppress us and the universality of our yearning for freedom. I'll pass it back to Daya. Oh, that, that's the or end. Whoever. <laughs> I'll pass it to, pass it to, to Rebecca. <laughs> oh, Rebecca. All right, thank you, PYM. All right, so I think we have uh, some special guests with us. We have DC Iwalk, and they're going to be discussing uh, some politicized prisoners known as the Vaughn 17. So I know we have Electra in the, in the house and uh, Helen as well. Can we maybe spotlight Electra? All right, thank you. All right, Electra, floor is yours. Thank you for joining us. Hey, everybody, thank you. Um, thank you for the introduction. My name is Electra, she they pronouns with DC Iwalk. Um, and I'm here to talk a little bit 
um, about the Vaughn 17. Switching gears, um, if you all can imagine, 2017, um, Trump is just in office, but unfortunately, we're going to focus on Joe Biden's home state. Um, Joe Biden, the person who wrote the 1994 crime bill, um, and going to his home state, Delaware, um, specifically to the James T. Vaughn prison in Smyrna. Um, this prison is really notorious for terrible conditions. Um, it, 2,500 people are imprisoned inside um, this really terrible prison. Um, it is notorious for staff abuse of incarcerated people. Um, there's no access to education. There's not enough food in the prison for people. Um, and people are continuously cycled into this prison. Um, so going back to 2017, on February 1st, prisoners rose up and took um, control of the C building at James T. Vaughn Prison. During their takeover, they liberated everybody inside the C building. They took COs as hostages. Um, they took a counselor as a hostage as well. And they took control of a radio to contact media and Governor Carney. They put out a list of demands um, during their takeover um, and they held the building for about 18 hours. During the course of the uprising, um, one CO was killed. They released people inside who wanted to get out. Um, and for many, this was the first time in a long time that they could feel free movement. After 18 hours, um, the CFRT team broke in um, pulled everyone out, beat up the prisoners, handcuffed them, um, and had them face down in the snowy dirt for hours. People were really badly injured, bleeding, um, and they were shackled to the ground um, as the CFT team to control. There were 18 prisoners charged with conspiracy to riot and murder charges. One person um, out of the 18 became a snitch for the state, state um, and a star witness. Another 17 stuck together and did collective defense. They refused to cooperate with the state. Um, this was many people's first time interacting um, and what joined them in this case was having charges together. Since then, um, many people have been in solitary for over a year um, while this case was pending. Oops. I'm sorry, I just got another call from an inside comrade unexpectedly. Um, and they were split into different trial groups. People who are fighting this case, um, the Vaughn 17 are still fighting their case. Uh, many are still in solitary. And I'm gonna pass it over to my comrade, Helen, um, for them to read a little bit more about one of the prisoners' experiences, uh, comrade Rook specifically. Helen, passing it over to you. Peace, everyone. I hope you all can hear me clearly. Um, my name is Helen. I organize with DC IWALK and the Vaughn 17 support team. And um, I wanted to share just a little bit about Ruck specifically. Thank you, Electra, for that amazing breakdown of um, the Vaughn 17 and the Vaughn uprising. Um, I loved hearing the opening about Mumia because I think Ruck um, and Mumia have very similar roots. Ruck also grew up in Philly and experienced criminalization and incarceration at a very young age. And the piece that I'm going to read from Ruck um, is a piece that he wrote about the collaboration between the state of Delaware and the state of Pennsylvania Departments of Correction and how they continue to export incarcerated freedom fighters um, and you know, utilize policies to continue to harm and dehumanize um, primarily black folks in the system. I think that there've been so many parallels between um, what's happening here in the US and what happens abroad. America loves to export its state sanctioned violence. And I think from, you know, thinking about the war on drugs here at home um, to the constant targeting of black and brown bodies. Um, I love that we're coming together in this way. Ruck was going to call in to um, share his words himself, um, 
but ever since the Vaughn 17 have released a book, which I'm going to put in the chat, um, the state not only transferred many um, slash all of the Vaughn 17 into different prisons, but also has put many folks who contributed to that book in, back into solitary confinement. They were in general population for about six to eight months. Um, and then after publishing the book and doing more public organizing, the state has moved them around yet again, removed them from, um, you know, they already are very far from their families and have isolated them even further and then put them into solitary confinement. So I think it's also worth mentioning that when folks who are locked up continue to rise up, the state tries to find new ways to silence them. Um, and so this piece that Ruck wrote was actually written in um, June of last year. And um, this is just some of his words. Delaware and Pennsylvania Department of Corrections are currently involved in a civil rights violation and human trafficking a form of quid pro quo to retaliate against individuals charged in the prison uprising on February 1st, 2017. According to the governor's report, the findings of investigators and former judges was that the inhumane condition of that prison, AKA James T. Vaughn Correctional Center, led to the uprising. Delaware also acknowledges within the CLASI agreement that the solitary confinement conditions were inhumane. Those in positions of political power campaign to their democratic base on the premises of progressive platforms, such as rehabilitative programs and prison reform. Yet Delaware has orchestrated a deal that has allowed them to pay Pennsylvania Department of Corrections to lock down freedom fighters indefinitely in solitary confinement under antiquated, racist, oppressive conditions that would violate Delaware's rules. These court systems, prison systems, and solitary confinement units aren't beneficial for anything other than to capitalize off the warehousing of human bodies and placing them on this conveyor belt of recidivism and mental deterioration. This process takes place through the lack of rehabilitation, educational programming, seclusion, sensory deprivation, and or ultimately allowing incarcerated freedom fighters to become addicted to mental health medication in search of relief from the mental abuse that is solitary confinement. We understand that every individual has to take some form of accountability for their actions, but we have to acknowledge that certain conditions, especially inhumane conditions and long-term solitary confinement have a negative impact on individual success. The harsh truth is individuals without infractions found not guilty or whose charges were dismissed are still locked down and want nothing but the chance to grow as human beings and have an opportunity for redemption to be a positive influence on their children, families, and their communities. Yet they have to risk starvation and making themselves targets of this system just for the hope to escape mental deterioration of solitary confinement. And so that statement was written by Ruck. Um, again, that was from last year, around the time that the Vaughn 17 organized with other incarcerated individuals um, to have a hunger strike against um, even more inhumane conditions. So this is, you know, just last year after two, three years, four years after the original uprising. Um, like Mumia, Ruck is facing um, life imprisonment without parole. And again, um, you know, whether you wanna buy the book on Amazon or uh, elsewhere, you know, fuck Amazon, but that's where the book is right now. Um, you know, I do encourage folks to um, buy V17 Speaks. It's not just a shameless plug. The funds, you know, for that book go to helping folks like Ruck be able to um, pay for legal fees to help fight the charges that they have, these bogus charges that continue to stand against them, um, despite many acquittals, and also to help support their families. I think, you know, like others have mentioned, families are also impacted by incarceration. So as we think about our freedom fighters behind bars, I think it's also important to uplift our freedom fighters who are family members um, who are fighting on the outside as well. So thank you all for listening and for continuing this work together. Thank you, Electra. Thank you, Helen. Really appreciate that um, breakdown of everything. And hopefully we can connect with Ruck and maybe others from the Vaughn 17 in the future. Um, yeah, definitely encourage folks to check out the book, you know, hear directly from the, the people themselves that are imprisoned. Uh, and so we can learn more about how to support them, about their experiences and, and you know, 
strengthen the solidarity between our, our groups. Um, all right, so I'm gonna, we're gonna do a real quick call to action uh, before we close out. And the call to action is uh, one, you know, I know that we have a lot of organizers here on this call uh, and, and people in organizations, but we want folks to join the National Alliance Against Racism and Political Repression. We want to, you know, that's how we strengthen the solidarity. We, we, you know, we join these coalitions and we struggle with each other, you know, uh, however that looks like. And, you know, we learn from each other. So the first, the first call to action is to join the National Alliance Against Racism and Political Repression. The second call to action, if you're in the DMV area, not just DC, but if you're in the DMV, we ask that you join the DC Alliance, the DC branch of the national organization. Um, so you can contribute to, uh, I mean, the solidarity that we're building. And then also our campaign, the Community Control of Police campaign, where we're building, uh, we're hoping to uh, really get more involved with mutual aid um, and, and build that out. We want to meet people's material needs. We need to meet people's material needs and we need to organize transformative justice, nonviolent conflict resolution. You know, basically meeting material needs and that transformative justice, that's us organizing, you know, ourselves towards our liberation without involving the state. You know, so that's a you know very basic thing. We need to do social investigation. Like I, I really loved how in uh, Anak Bayan's presentation, they talked about the research that's being done, you know, that's exposing what's actually happening to these folks. And I think that's simple, you know, surveying, surveying communities and, um, you know, seeing what they're actually dealing with. Not what us, the, the, the activists, the organizer thinks, you know, that they need or what's going on with them, but what they're actually experiencing and what, you know, material needs they have that need to be met, what they're dealing with in their own neighborhoods and in their lives, you know. Um, so we need to build, we need to build that solidarity economy, um, transformative justice. We need to have, a, you know, cultural revolution of sorts, you know, where we, we relate to each other differently, socially, economically, you know, politically, uh, ecologically, you know, we have to really relate to each other and the earth differently. Um, and, and when we have that, you know, that cohesiveness, you know, when we have like a, you know, a movement of organizations of people, then we can have like, you know, um, we, we have some, we can have some dual power and we can actually start putting pressure on the necks of the, of these, you know, local and state government, um, you know, where it's, we, you know, we're going to do these things, you know, this is what we want, this is our demand, and we're going to give you a, a window <laughs> of, for you to meet these demands, but if you don't meet our demands, and, you know, we're going to, we're going to build power and take what, what we need to do, and so, you know, um, yeah, that's, the, the call is to join these, the, the coalition, so we can build power. Um, and I guess I, I'll pass it over to our facilitator, Rebecca, for any final words. Also, I want to thank every, everybody that presented. And please, you know, if you had a call to action that you put in the chat, go ahead and put it in the chat one more time. Um, and yeah, thank you, everybody, for coming out. Rebecca? Yeah. Um, so, you know, you, you pretty much summed it all. And I, I really just want to um uplift every um all of the organizations organizers that um presented today the connections were made really clear about wh who and what our enemies are and and the charge to move forward in building a international people struggle um the power is with the people we are resistance um we are the resistance and um, there is a, a very short um, chant call to action and it, and it goes like, you know, um, what's the call? And, then, and the response is free them all. I mean, that's, that's really what the overall call to action is. And this was a very powerful session and, I, and we definitely um, should do it some more. I mean, even just discussing what a politicized prisoner is and how, how that feeds into all of the work that we need to do to get ourselves free.
because we are the only ones that can free ourselves. We are our own liberators. All power to the people.